Good evening, and welcome to another edition of Ask Me Anything. My name is Jay Gerber, and we're down here this uh, Monday evening with a live call-in program. We have an interesting topic this evening, one that uh, probably will be of interest to just about everyone who's watching. It's uh, retirement planning, and I have as my guest this evening uh, Larry Olson, who is a principal with Carbajal Olson Financial Services here in Davis. And uh, Larry, welcome to the program. Thanks, Jay. It's a pleasure to join you tonight. Yeah. Before we get into our topic, which is uh, retirement and how to plan for it, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? You have a pretty familiar face. I think people have seen you around town for a good many years. Okay. What? How'd you come to Davis, and what have you been doing since you arrived? Well, I've been in Davis since 1976. Uh, I went to school at Sac State, but my wife was going to school here at Davis, and uh, we uh, ended up getting married in 1977. Mm -hmm. And we had worked uh, in different restaurants. Uh, I myself worked at uh, AJ Bumps. I think we all um, remember AJ Bumps. And uh, I was there on their opening night, and my wife worked down the highway at uh, in Dixon at Cattleman's. Yes. And in 1983, uh, we had the, uh, the, the gumption to uh, take on our own restaurant and uh, have uh, been at Cafe California uh, ever since. So um, yeah. about seven years ago, my wife suggested that maybe one of us uh, leave the business and start a new career. And uh, she made the decision that I would be the one to do that. You, you drew the short <laughs> straw? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And uh, so I decided to uh, uh, pursue a, a career in the life insurance industry as I knew a, a recruiter for New York Life. Yes. And he convinced me that I had a career in the financial services field. And so for a couple of years I, I sold life insurance and quickly discovered that um, not all of uh, uh, person's financial goals and aspirations can be solved through the use of life insurance and there was uh, many other avenues for me to, to delve into, uh, mainly investments. Yes. And so I uh, got my securities license in 1996 and uh, have been working diligently in the uh, investment uh, yeah. and planning field uh, since. Well I'm guessing that uh, many of the people that come to see you have an interest in retirement and uh, planning for their retirements. I know there are other financial goals people have, uh, educating children, um, buying uh, properties, uh, who knows what they want to do, but retirement is one that seems to affect just about everyone. I guess at some point or another in our lives we will all probably retire. What is the kind of the broad uh, definition of retirement in your, from your perspective? I mean, what is it that... Uh, well, from the financial planning side of things, uh, retirement issues probably consume about 70 to 80 percent of what we do uh, in our office. Yes. Um, uh, it takes on many different aspects from uh, helping people, you know, set some goals, um, look at what kind of lifestyle they want to have in retirement, and coming up with a plan that uh, they can put into place, um, starting very, with very small investments. Um, sometimes as they grow uh, w with age, uh, their investing capabilities grow, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully by the time uh, they get to, to that golden year. Um, we have planned well enough that they've met their goals and uh, it's, it's a, a fairly on, uh, you know, long ongoing process. It's not a Larry, instant success. Larry, when, when should someone uh, begin planning for their retirement? Is there a particular well, age? <laughs> as, uh, hopefully as early as possible, but I, I think in reality if, if you can get started in the early part of your working career uh, with a 401k plan or a uh, uh, a pension of some type, uh, the advantages are tremendous to start in your 20s. Yes. Realistically, most people don't uh, think too much about it till they get to that magic age of about age 35 where yes. they figure out that they're just not going to you know, live forever and, and that uh, there is a, an end to their working career and they may want to uh, start planning for that. I'd like to ask you to expand a little bit on, you mentioned pensions and the 401k plan. Uh, before we have you tell us a little more uh, about those two terms, I want to remind everyone this is a live program, so if you have a question about your retirement plan or a general question about retirement, uh, please give us uh, a call at 757-2419. My mom promised she'd call tonight. So okay, I, good. Might. Let's <laughs> hope we hear from her. No, All I'm right, you mentioned 401k. What, right. what is a 401k? Well, 401k is probably the most uh, uh, popular plan for private businesses um, uh, in, in 
this day and age. And typically what it is is a salary reduction plan yes. where uh, an individual may have money drawn out of their paycheck and sent off to an investment management company uh, and then they can have a, a, a variety of decisions on how that money would be invested uh, from a conservative to an aggressive uh, type of an investment. Typically in, in the mutual fund side, although many 401ks now have capability for you to invest in individual stocks uh, and individual bonds. I noticed uh, in this morning's Sacramento Bee there was a lead story on 401ks. I think for the first time in anyone's history the average value of the 401k has uh, declined a little in the year 2000 as opposed to uh, 1999 and it's down even a little bit more in 2001 but that's kind of the nature of investing and in markets so uh, no big surprise in that in that story well when you're looking at uh, retirement investments typically you're working with uh, a timeline of uh, you know 20, 20 years, 15 years, yes. something like that. And so people tend to be a, a little bit more aggressive than they might be with money that they're going to use in three, four, five years. Yes. And so it's not uh, surprising that you might get a decrease in value uh, with the kind of markets that we've had the last two years. Are there limits on the amount of money a person can put into his or her 401k plan? Uh, in a 401k plan, you can put up to $10,500 a year uh, out of your own salary reduction. Yes. You can have as much as 25% of your income put into a 401k plan when you include matching contributions and potential profit sharing uh, that employers might do. Yes. But then you're getting into the more complicated uh, types of plans that, are, that some uh, employers will. Are there other work. plans that are popular and available to most working people? Well, in Davis, uh, of course, with the University of California right here, uh, there's a tremendous number of employees uh, that live here in town. And so we see a lot of, uh, uh, or work with a lot of people that have what's known as a 403B plan. Yes. Now, 403B plans were started back in the early 60s by John Kennedy as a way to encourage people to go into uh, nonprofit uh, employment and also into teaching. So they made it available to both of those groups. Um, 403B plans generally work very much like a 401K. They have a little bit uh, looser guidelines, um, but typically they, they, they're kind of in an interchangeable type of plan. All right. Now, Larry, uh, when people come to you, I'm guessing that one of the questions that comes up has to do with Social Security and the role at Social Security, which we've had in this country for 65 years now, uh, plays in the average retirement. Uh, what, what, what do you... Talk, what do you tell people? And, uh, well, the, the common uh, thought process now is uh, amongst most investors is that Social Security is not going to be there for them. Yeah. I, I do you yourself have that feeling? I hesitate to go that far. I think uh, for, uh, unless maybe you're in your early 20s, um, uh, I think it's actually funded through uh, the year 2033 right now. Yes. Um, so there will be a certain amount set aside for each of us as we move along. Uh, it certainly is not playing as large a role in uh, the retirement process as it once did, um, nor do I think people uh, are counting on it um, as a to major the, part yes. of their retirement yeah. plan. But right now, it, it's a fairly significant portion, mm -hmm. as many times as much as 50%, and many people we see uh, that uh, that's tip, that really their only retirement um, income. For someone who has contributed for, I think it's 40 quarters into the, into the plan, um, I guess what you are sent monthly is determined by how much you paid in over your lifetime? Exactly. Yeah, and that number could go as high as? I, I think uh, we're in the 11 to $1,200 range yeah. in the, at the peak. For I think it's still under $1,300 yeah. for an individual right now, right. per month. Whereas couples, it'd be more than that, of course, because right, depending they both on, paid, paid in. Right. Well, um, Let's get to some of uh, the more specific questions. And again, if you have questions uh, out there, we hope you'll call us at 757-2419. Uh, Our guest this evening is Larry Olson. Um, Larry, what are some of the more common mistakes people make with their retirement plans? Well, I think the most common mistake is that people don't get started until maybe uh, uh, they perceive it to be too late. But, uh, you know, we always encourage uh, young people clients that we see to get started as early as possible. So the, the, that's probably the, the number one mistake is that, that 
they, it's one of those things that you put off in life. Um, many times, uh, especially for younger people, they're not in a career that, that has a plan option available to them that is publicized on a daily basis to them. So for many um, service employees, uh, people working for small businesses, um, there's not a plan in effect for them, and so they tend not to put it aside for themselves. Yeah. Sometimes it takes, a, it's, it's a habit, I guess, that has to be developed. And I know some parents like to start it with their children, the idea that you actually save some money out of every paycheck. Even if it's a small paycheck at the beginning of your working career, you, yeah. I think I've heard that phrase, pay yourself first or some such thing. And uh, heavens, I've not been able to follow that early on anyway. But uh, uh, it's a good habit, I know, to, to take a portion, a percentage of your income and well, I think put it into something. Educating children about uh, the financial world is something that every parent should uh, take into account at some point. That they uh, and if they don't have the expertise to do it, um, they they have their financial advisor um, uh, have their children into their office, talk to them about mutual funds, stocks, how they how they work, what happens, yeah, um, and and give them an idea, and then yeah, like. If, for myself, my daughter, we, you know, we've tried to uh, include her in the discussions that we have regarding our long-term financial goals, um, set some goals for her, and uh, you know, have, have taught her to look in the paper and watch certain stocks. And many of her classes now is in elementary school have a certain segment on that. Really? And, uh, uh, and she's experienced it in two of her classes. So yeah. I, I think it's uh, something that uh, the educational field should delve into a yeah. little bit more. Larry, I'm wondering if we if it would be helpful, tell me if it's not helpful, if we could maybe uh, talk a little more specifically about a kind of a typical couple. Uh, let's say a couple Certainly. in their mid-30s uh, with, you know, not too much income, not too little income, but maybe uh, one salary, uh, one uh, part of the, uh, one salary is 50000 the other is thirty-five. So there's a total combined income of $85,000. There's a home involved, probably with some mortgage payments still going on, a couple of children. What, um, what kind of a uh, saving guide would you recommend for, for this kind of couple? Well, as far as planning goes, we try to approach uh, retirement planning as just part of their overall financial plan. Yes. And I always liken it to a mail slot cupboard where you have a number of different slots available and you set targets and goals for each one of your financial um, uh, issues that you're yes. working with. So I like to see my clients have an emergency fund. Yes. Um, right off, that's probably the most important thing. I think that they have three to six months is that worth the, of... Is that the rule of thumb, three yeah, to six months? And depending on what type of financial stability and, and job stability they have, if they're, if they're both individually employed in, in fairly uh, risky small businesses, say, um, a restaurant or a car wash possibly, um, that <laughs> yeah, those types of businesses fail fairly yes. regularly. So somebody like that may want to have a little bit more of an emergency fund set up. Yes. Then uh, beyond the emergency fund, then we, we, we go through a, a process of trying to uh, determine what's the most important next financial goal. Typically, it's retirement. Yes. Then it would work towards college education for their kids. Yep. Sometimes they have uh, goals such as they want to uh, upgrade their home and, and move to a new home, or they want a second home for uh, potentially to live in in retirement or and to enjoy in their uh, you know, uh, leisure uh, cabin in the mountains or something yeah. like that. So right. it's never too early to start saving for those types of things. And then as we set priorities, we'll, we'll target a certain amount of money each month to go into each one of those slots. All right. And for retirement, you know, I, I would love to see my clients be able to save 10% of their overall income mm -hmm. in, the, in the wage category that we're talking about. Yes. So about $8,500 to $10,000 a year. Now, let's say this, uh, this uh, couple is successful in being able to save that kind of money. What are, what are their options is, and how should it be invested? I mean, this kind of gets to the question of risk. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you discuss risk with your clients. Well, a risk versus reward is, yes. is one of the things that we spend quite a bit of time with. Um, mutual funds are a great vehicle for small investors. When you look at investing into the stock market, um, if you want to say you have a thousand dollars to invest, um, you can buy, you know, say. Uh, 10 shares of a $100 stock, and let's just say it's General Motors, yes. um, 
for sake of argument, you're placing your whole thousand dollars into that one company's uh, fortune, yep. whether or not they make money, uh, and are rewarded through uh, investors' perception of how successful that company is. That also affects the price of stocks. When you're investing in mutual funds, what you're investing in is a pooled fund. So you have my money, your money, hundreds, thousands, sometimes millions, millions. In, some, in some funds mm -hmm. like Fidelity, Magellan, things like billions. that. Billions. Yeah, you'll have uh, a million investors putting money into this thing. And then the investment manager is then picking maybe between 100 to 200, sometimes as many as 300 stocks. So you are diversifying across Diversification. the Diversification. So for a small investor, you, you, you decrease your volatility by sure. diversifying in such a manner. So mutual funds are probably where we start with people. Yes. When they get to a certain level, and I, I like to see my clients not even think about uh, investing in individual stocks until uh, they have at least a $100,000 portfolio right. of mutual funds. Yeah. How, how, I'm just, this is a little aside because we're all aware of the fact that the investment markets uh, here in the United States and worldwide for that matter, have not had their best 18 months or so, dating back to March of uh, 2000. People st you still uh, encourage people to, to look to the good mutual funds uh, to get started? Well, yeah, there's an old saying, you want to buy low, sell high. Yes. Um, unfortunately, uh, investor psychology is one that uh, they want to invest when things are going well. And, and uh, typically, yeah. Uh, for long-term type of investment, you want to invest at regular intervals. So you're catching both the lows and the highs, which brings down your average cost uh, on your purchases. So that's what they call dollar cost averaging. This is where so, you invest a set dollar amount every month, right. every quarter. So, so we are encouraging regardless. people to continue investing, yes. even through the bad times, yeah. for their long-term goals on a regular basis. If you've come into a lump sum of money, say through retirement or through uh, uh, inheritance or uh, uh, a sale of property or something like that, then y you might want to be very cautious in this type of a market. Um, as we've seen, uh, it can drop fairly quickly. So you want to look at, again, diversifying across a number of different asset classes, stocks, bonds, um, and when I'm talking both stocks and bonds, that means stock mutual funds also, yes. bond mutual funds, and certain amount of cash, uh, money markets, yeah. and, and those types of investments. Um, there's other types of fixed income uh, investment pools, such as uh, senior floating rate funds that, mm -hmm. are, that are basically loan yeah. funds. So, Larry, how, how does one decide how much of a nest egg they're going to need at uh, the time they start this retirement uh, period in their lives? That, that's a very good question, and that's one that we spend um, a significant amount of time with because that's, that's one thing that most people want to know right off the bat is, uh, how much am I going to need in retirement? Yes. So we go through a series of, of questions again uh, uh, and a questionnaire trying to determine what kind of lifestyle they're going to want in retirement, uh, how much, typically we'll start with what, what are they making now and w minus their putting money into retirement, their house payment, things that they, they probably won't have to do when they are retired, yes. um, we can subtract out from there. And so we can project that over a series of years. So if they're in their early 40s, we know we have roughly uh, 18 to 20 years to work. We can take into account uh, a certain rate of inflation, 3 to 4 percent, somewhere in that range, which it historically runs at. Lately, it's been a little bit lower than that. But inflation is, is the big key there. And then we use assumed rates of return on their account. I like to use uh, eight percent uh, as an assumed rate of return over 8%. time, um, figuring that that's very conservative. And when we're looking at money that we know we're going to need at a certain point in time, I like to err on the side of uh, conservatism. Sure. Yes. So using those assumptions, we can set a target for how much we're going to have, and then. How, what it's going to take to get there. So if they're currently putting in $200 a month and they have $20,000 in their retirement account and to get to their goal, they may have to raise that to 250 or 300 a month yes. and try to, to get a little bit better rate of return. So we look at how we might uh, influence their, their investment decisions and, and uh, get them to take maybe a little bit more risk or a little less risk yeah. sometimes. Now, g g getting to that, uh, that nest egg, uh, again, the purpose of that is to provide income for the duration of one's life. 
Uh, and uh, what, what is, I assume, I think you made reference to this earlier, that in retirement, the, the amount of income necessary is probably less. Hopefully your, your home's paid off, your kids are educated. Uh, you may have other kinds of expenses, but uh, is there a rule of thumb? I mean, in retirement, you need 60% of what you uh, uh, maybe had. I, the last I think a conventional planner would, would, would say 60 to 70% yes. of your, of your uh, current income or your working your, income yes. is what you'd need in retirement. I think realistically, most people like to think that they're going to live with the same, same amount of income. Same amount of income. Um, and I think uh, with two income, two wage earners in today's society, it's pretty common that they're capable of saving that kind of, uh, of a nest egg yes. and, and putting that. Yeah. Forward, so okay. So many times uh, there's the old uh, philosophy of your your tax liability will be less in retirement. We're finding that that's not necessarily the case. That people many times are paying uh, as high a percentage in retirement as they were in, in their working years. So, Larry, I got a question I want to ask you. Before I do, I again would like to encourage our uh, viewers this evening. If you have any question about uh, your retirement situation, uh, we have a great expert down here in Larry Olson. So. Please uh, feel free to pick up the phone and give us a call. I think the number's on the screen. Larry, um, when I was growing up, it seemed like the magic retirement age was 65. Uh, you know, all my dad's, my, my friends, uh, my, my friend's parents worked till they were 65 and then they were kind of fully retired. I sense that's different now than it was 25, 50 years ago. People are retiring earlier. Uh, some people are choosing to work even though they could fully retire later. They want to keep active. What, what kind of uh, things are people planning on? Uh, what, what, what do they tell you? Well, the whole retirement planning uh, industry and, and retirement, people's view of retirement has changed dramatically. And mainly around the idea that we used to work for the same company for 35, 40 years. Yes. We had a pension when we retired. We typically retired at age 65. Uh, and nobody or very few people actually uh, saved in a qualified uh, retirement account, meaning a pre-tax account. They might save on the outside and invest in properties and, and yes. stocks and, and, yeah. and such. But uh, it's only been fairly a new phenomenon in the last uh, uh, 25 to 20 years, somewhere in that range, that 401ks and other types of similar salary reduction plans have become popular as major employers have moved away from providing such lucrative pensions the old and have pen put company pension plan right, is, and have is put, fading away. put the re responsibility on to the individual employee yes. so that has given employees a much greater stake in their retirement and much more flexibility and and many of them have chosen because they've been diligent savers have been very good at it and invested well uh, have found that they can retire at an earlier yeah. age so it's not uncommon that people have a retirement uh, age goal of 60 or or yeah. many people you always hear that oh, I want to retire at 50 realistically I mean most people don't retire till 60. Let's say somebody has a retirement goal of 60 years of age because this kind of leads into my next question how many years uh, should one plan on their nest egg uh, supporting them I mean you What's, it gets into life expectancies, I right. imagine. What do, you, what do you tell people? Well, modern medicine has, has uh, dramatically altered the landscape in this area. And so uh, I typically now, if you're a healthy 65-year-old, we try to plan on 30 years of retirement. Yes. And if uh, for people who are in their 20s that, that we do projections for, many times we'll project out past age 100. Um, so, uh, and when you're looking at 60, 70 years of compound interest, the, the numbers get staggering. Yeah. Uh, and a half a percent rate of return can mean as much as five to ten million dollars in, in your overall nest egg at the end. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's pretty important to start paying attention. So let's, let's assume you've uh, started early, you've been a, a good uh, diligent saver, uh, you're at that age, 60, 65, that you've always felt you wanted to retire, and this nest egg is there and it's, it's a healthy one. Um, how do you want to draw on that? I mean, are there there are ob obviously some options? Uh, right. Well, for qualified money, and then again, that means money that uh, has been yeah. put away pre-tax. Um, there are minimum distribution requirements. So at age 70 and a half, you have to start taking yes, money. Yes, you out. can't wait any longer than that, right. or you start paying penalties. Uh, exactly, yeah. and the penalties get kind of severe if yes. you don't take them out. So. 
but typically people will start wanting to uh, access their retirement accounts at their retirement age of say 60 or so and and you want to focus your money and your investment portfolio your your asset allocation that means how your money is invested number one you probably are going to get more conservative with your money uh, because you're going to be accessing it. You do want to take into account that you're going to probably live for 35, 40 years yeah. in, in retirement uh, if your health is, is good at age 60. So you're going to want some growth in there. So diversification is a must. And then you're going to want to start accessing your money from those points um, that uh, uh, fit your overall asset allocation yeah. portfolio. I suppose there's so, a, I mean, there's the, the the options kind of range on the on the most conservative I, annuities. I know are one way of people have done. Uh, right, and that's that your typical some, pension plan. Yes. Usually, is just an annuitization process yes. of a lump sum of a, amount of money. So, if say you're working for the University of California, you're retiring at age 65, they're going to guarantee you a certain wage until every month you die. until you die. You can take the second option of having it be for you, both you and your spouse. Yes, and then there's different uh, options like that. So. Uh, you know, you can work in that direction of, of taking a, a pension such as that and supplementing it with your own 403B plan or 401K plan and taking money on a regular basis. Typically, you want to pay attention to taxation so you're not taking too much um, and maybe losing some of your uh, money to taxes that you might have not had to do. So, yeah. Larry, I, I hate to cut you off at this point because I'm getting the signal that we're about out of time. This has really been... A a fast-moving program. Um, well, I knew I could and, talk. But, uh, <laughs> that is quick. I just wonder if you could summarize. Uh, are there, you know, what are the big uh, Larry Olson guidelines for successful retirement? Do you have two or three points that you'd like to leave our listeners with this sure. evening? Sure. Well, one is is get started as early as possible and, and be true to your plan. Yes. Be realistic with it and and follow through on a regular basis and monitor your plan uh, at least annually. Uh, uh, and if you feel intimidated by the process, don't uh, be afraid to contact a financial advisor and work with them. Uh, the professionals in our field uh, make up for whatever you might have to pay them uh, on a typical basis. All right, so. I, I know that's true. Well, I'd like to thank our guest, Larry Olson, who has been here with us this evening, uh, telling us about uh, retirement planning and how we can all become better at that. Um, this has been the July edition of Ask Me Anything. We'll be back here next month, uh, second Monday, and I think that's the 13th of August. Not sure what our topic will be. We may have to follow up with you, Larry, because I have a feeling there were a lot of things left unsaid. Um, well, my mom never got through. I yeah, she didn't get through here. <laughs> so uh, uh, again, thank everyone for uh, joining us. And uh, from the studios at Davis Community Television, we'd like to Bid everyone a good evening. Mm -hmm.